Now on the podcast, Ralph Hildenbeutel, who alongside Sven Feit created some of the most groundbreaking music of the 90s, and Ralph's still at it. If you've seen Super Sex on Netflix, then you've heard his latest soundtrack. The vision was, I think that there was no vision really in that sense. You have this guy coming from DJing, and then you have this musicians who are always thinking chords and harmonies and stuff like this and both sides telling each other open your mind i never would have done this in that way on a ambient record i would have thought too much about things can i do it or not and then swan was on the other side you can do everything i've been lucky to be there uh because you have to be in the right time and the right place as well to do this and it happened and this is rare. Everybody knows when I say Rocco Sifredi, everyone says, ah, Rocco Sifredi. So I Googled Rocco Sifredi. I was like, oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> <laughs> it's, the, it's the scene, it's a cue, it's the, some, a situation which needs some music. Director has a vision, producer has a vision, Netflix has a vision. Don't go away. Ralph Hildenbeutel coming up in just a second. But please subscribe. It helps me and it allows you to be the first when I load something new up on this channel. Okay, here's Ralph Hildenbeutel. So Ralph Hildenbeutel, welcome. Um, where are you? Hello, thanks for inviting me. I'm in Frankfurt now. Were you uh, born in Frankfurt? I, I was born in Frankfurt actually and I had some, I've been a lot of around, but I, the main base is still Frankfurt, actually, yeah. What sort of music were you brought up about, around with your parents? Okay, that's uh, interesting. Um, because I never liked what they listened to, kind of. Um, and when I started to listen to music, and I started with the piano at nine. Uh, so quite early I was into music, but I liked classical music through the piano but, lessons, but also jazz and all this kind of stuff. What were their tastes? Well, uh, I, it was not schlager, but kind of stuff I considered cheesy or boring or too far away. I, I can give you even names, I don't know. It would have been like this, really a generation thing. It was the opposite of what I wanted to listen to. <laughs> I mean, you said you went to piano lessons at nine. Were you like me, where although it was sort of a semi-choice on my behalf, it was more the choice of my mother, or was it you, you wanted to do that? No, actually, it was, I wanted to do that. Uh, they, I, my grandmother had an organ and a piano at her house, and I uh, always used to go there and play around. And so they offered me... The option to say do you want to learn an instrument my brother as well so i chose the piano while he took the guitar and i was immediately obsessed kind of and we had the lucky situation there was a piano teacher living in the same building uh, so she came to us once a week and they really had to kind of we had this damper in the piano to make it more not so loud which I hated <laughs> these times because they said you cannot play the whole day. So that was a lucky situation. So, but I kind of wanted to really to do it. Yeah. Was was your grandmother culturally interested or did she just have a piano around? She just more or less had a piano around because her husband used to play, was in music, but I didn't never met him. And uh, so she wasn't really a musician at all, but it was just there and I always used the stuff. So this piano teacher, this woman that, that taught you the piano, was she, in effect, a bit of a mentor to you as well? It was interesting because she was quite young and I stayed with her, I think, 10 years. Um, and she taught me a lot of stuff, not just pure piano pieces from the classical side, because she, she saw that I also had interest in a little bit more modern stuff, jazzy stuff, and she was quite open to pick rec time from Scott Joplin, whatever, and go a bit in this session. And she also taught me a lot of stuff towards 
um, music theory. I learned how to write a choral, like from the 16th century and stuff like this. Um, so I took quite a lot of, she was giving me a lot of input, which I used later. And I rem remembered, remembered often, it's good that I learned that when I had the piano lessons. I mean, it does sound like she sort of, your interests were quite broad in any case, I think, but she obviously broadened your interests even more. But you mentioned that you were very interested in jazz at a young age. And it may be a cliche to say this, but often people are interested in jazz at an older age because it's <laughs> a very sophisticated <laughs> music form. So it's quite unusual to be interested in, in jazz at a young age, don't you think? It's, it's I, I really, I don't know how this came, where this, my father, some of the few stuff I liked was like Benny Goodman or even James Last Records because with the brasses when I did like a bit jazzy but in a cheesy style. And I think through that, um, I slipped more into the real jazz stuff. Count Basie, name them. I hope all the piano players and I made tape recordings from radio and I was really into it somehow. I don't know why. Because as you say, it's a bit, a bit weird in the young age to, to like this kind of stuff. So there you are, you're learning piano, you're interested in different styles uh, of music. What did your parents, and often our parents want us to be something, they want us to be something <laughs> stable, where we have a fixed income, where we're gonna be okay. And if you go down a cultural path, you're often not fulfilling their wishes. So what did they want you to be? And were they supportive in your choices as you started to grow? It's interesting, it has been kind of a diverse thing because they supported me a lot with doing music and they saw that I was really into it. And I, with 14, I started to play in the school bands and I got more and more into music. And with 16, I was in studios already and they even took me out of school for a couple of days to do some recording somewhere. On the other side, of course, it was music. You, not a safe thing. I, you're never gonna really make money with it. And uh, they expected me to do some, to learn some, to study something proper. And when I finished school, I told them, yeah, I can go study learn piano teacher or whatsoever and I thought cool but I never did it and <clears throat> once they recognized my that this was just like talking from my side we had some really tough times but I could prove them different luckily <laughs> you said you were in school bands at that period what did you know and you mentioned also like the piano teacher over that period had a big influence later on your knowledge and and what you could do later what influence did being in the bands have and where did that really come from was it performing live what was it i think it was the the there's the piano thing and mainly classical pieces and the, it's one direction and i had this interest in doing something more modern playing in bands to Having a keyboard was one of my biggest wishes then till I got my first, I think it was a Casio uh, keyboard for my parents and playing bands to modern music. At that time, it was more like rock, synth, rock, rock uh, oriented stuff, bass stuff. But um, yeah, I was like several directions kind of. I never was like really this like just classical guy or just, and now I just go modern or electronic. So it's an interest was so big to do other things as well. I mean, one thing for me when I was a teenager, I think it was really clear that music was also an escape from my parents' world, or <laughs> even for me from the world in which I was in to a world that I wanted to go to. Was music ever an escape for you? Yeah, sure. I, I think quite, <clears throat> yes, definitely. Uh, in both ways from, not from my parents, but from my parents' world, which was, I had an other idea of living, kind of, from, from style, from taste, and stuff like this, just. Um, and also, I I was not that like a 
super shy guy, but I was more calm always. And in with playing with in bands and doing music, I could let go on another level, which uh, it always helped me a lot and always was kind of an escape from from the other side. Yeah. I mean, because you were so into music, I just wondered whether you were a fairly isolated child at school. Were you were you a loner or were you, you know, surrounded by a lot of friends? Because you obviously <laughs> you have to spend a lot of time with music. Well, no, I wasn't a loner actually. I was I was doing quite well in, in with my social life, but um when it started with the bands, uh, you you orientate to you look for people around you who do also music and then it very quickly became other guys or girls from outside school, not from the same class and so you have your own posse or people around you and more and more after year after year it became more and more i was more isolated from school i had good friends at school no doubt but um you you get into your own world of course and then when you start to do your first studio jobs or recordings or with the other bands playing so it's a complete different scene than what you the people around you in the school yeah I mean, you mentioned that you, I think you were in a studio when you were about 17. So what was your first experience of production and how did that come about? Couldn't really say like one first experience because I quite early started to do stuff at home, like classically, like the tape to tape stuff, because I was fascinated by how kind of layer keyboard sounds and stuff like this. And then when we had the rehearsal room, I often went there by myself to do, what do you call it, other than demos, like trying multi-track layering stuff. And then we did record band demos in studios. I was fascinated by this, all, the whole recording producing process. And then I started to do at a certain point some um, demo productions for artists on a low level. It went really step by step on, on very slow uh, steps. Um, so I don't have this one aha effect um, situation in the in the studio it just came slowly but surely but did you always have confidence because when I'm sort of looking into your into your story it does feel it's such a young you know you were so young doing certain things I mean even let's talk about Baldesalt so the comedy duo uh in Germany from Hessen yeah. and you produced an album for them at a very young age. And I just wonder, you know, how much confidence you need to have? Or was it that you were so young that you never really thought about confidence, you just did it? I was actually, especially at that time, I was always always really the youngest, the nest Um I remember once with the band where I played, uh, we had gigs. I was 17, I think. We played in Hamburg in the Cross of Freiheit and they made fun because I wasn't a, actually officially allowed to walk through <laughs> on the way to the cross of pride and all the, the girls came uh, and stuff and they made fun of me but um on the other side yeah i was quite confident in what to do and i also think in a young age you do not think too much about if you if you're into it and you just go for it kind of bit having this view and i i was lucky to have uh, my first publisher manager who was the manager from Badesals um, and who was booking our gigs in other bands and I worked with him together quite early and he gave me opportunities to work with Badesals, this comedy duo or do some demo jobs for Sony who were in Frankfurt still at that time, Sony Music uh, luckily so I could slip into that world more and more. Yeah from a low level. And uh, yeah, I was, was the youngest. Yeah, that's true. Growing up in Frankfurt, of course, at, at that time, um, and someone like Sven Fate would have been on your radar before you met him, I presume, um, because he'd already had these two off albums, hadn't yeah. he, by the time that you met him. How did you meet him? And what was your impression of him when you meet him, met him? I, I knew, of course, like da 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 da, electrica salsa. I never, I never liked it in on the school parties. <laughs> but um, he met then uh, Matthias Hoffmann, the guitar player I used to play in the band when I was 
17. And then at a certain time, everybody did his own stuff. And he met Sven like in a cafe in Frankfurt. And they've been really fascinated by these two opposite worlds, DJ, musician. So they thought, let's do something together. That sounds interesting. And quite quickly, they started to found IQ records on a very low level with, with the manager, Heinz Roth, who was managing Sven by that time. And then Matthias called me and said, listen, uh, forget everything you, you've you done so far with the pop stuff and pop production. Uh, we have to meet. This is really cool. It's going to be something really different. You have to meet Sven and you have to join the team. And that this was how I met Sven then actually in the studio. And that time was the X Studio, their project. And we just started to jam around. Doing so, I don't know what was the first thing we did with Sven Barbarella or even a remix for No Fate, something like this. Where, and we figured out, oh, that works really well. We had a really good vibe from the beginning on. So how did you how did you actually test each other out? And were there certain roles that were sort of decided in that initial period? I mean, they've worked together already. I, I did a lot of, um, even I was coming more from the pop, still pop rock influence side. I listened to electronic stuff, of course. I liked electronic music. I did a lot of demo productions, which I showed to Matthias and Sven, and I really liked it. So that's why I said, look, you have to come to the studio. You have to do something. And I think it was just not checking out. It was just, let's do try something together. And, and you... I think it was a remix or something. I don't remember actually. And we just did it and it went well. So, and that was it. Uh, okay, cool. <laughs> Let's do more. <laughs> so there wasn't a particular vision from, from either side. It was just doing. Yeah, the vision is, the vision was, I think that there was no vision really in that sense because you have this guy coming from DJing and then you have this, musicians who are always thinking chords and harmonies and stuff like this and both sides telling each other open your mind and uh, let's be free and Sven always said let's be free guys don't think about it and we said okay and we can we could offer him things he couldn't do from our sides okay let's be free guys we can do like but you can do like this and play this and he said oh cool but let's cut it here and just repeat it or whatever and I think the inspiration and the vision was just to go and to get each other's ideas. And because it's been so from different perspectives, which made it so interesting, especially in that time. Now it's normal, but in the 90s, beginning of 90s, it was like really, wow, let's just do something. Go for it. Was it an equal partnership from the beginning? Because you came into something where Sven was already a known figure. I mean, he wasn't a known figure in the music that you're about to make, but he was a known figure. So I just wondered at the beginning, or did you did you have to sort of develop that into an equal partnership at some point? It it was in the in the studio was I have to say really kind of an equal partnership because uh, I could see everybody was so inspired and thirsty at that time to suck out each other's ideas and same as I was inspired by his open view in arrangements or structures or how to make music different he was open to take our side from the musical side and so on that level he could really work on the same level it never was like I tell you what to do and you're just my musician or other I tell you what to do because you're just a DJ or whatever it was always like on the same level which makes it so effective also i think i mean it was a very exciting time in frankfurt at that during that period you know obviously iq and logic and uh that was going on and then of course you had the um the club scene you had omen which matthias sven was it matthias sven and uh michael munzing i think at the beginning were, yeah yeah were the owners at the beginning um, and then you had a cool story in Grey at the airport that had been going, you know, a long time, but was still a phenomenal club. How exciting was that period for you? And can you tell me the first time you were in a club and you heard um, techno music and what it did to you? 
by the time, of course, that was like really big time because it has been so concentrated and Frankfurt is not big. And you had, as you said, actually everything was about two or three clubs happening. And we've been each weekend in the club, not just partying, of course, but also listening to the new stuff other producers did or DJs and going back to the studio in the week. Um, I don't know, I was in clubs several times before, of course, the Sven time already. Um, listen, I was also in the Dorian Gray already, but on a, it changed when you work together and start to make things or hear things different. And when I don't have this first time in the club thing, it kind of developed, it was really fast when it got into, but it was um, within a couple of months probably, but uh, not like the, the one time which changed my view of thing. It came, but it came really quickly then, especially after starting to work intensely in this direction and forget about everything you did before. No song structure anymore, not three minutes or chorus after, or got no vocals in the first years, no vocals allowed at all. Um, you want to do it 10 minutes? So we, let's make a 10 minute track. Everything was, it doesn't matter. You said that, you know, making music um, with Sven and going to a club gave, gave you a different perspective than being a consumer, being someone like me going to a club and hearing music. What, what do you mean by that? What was the difference? It, it has been for us such a new thing, kind of, that being in a club, listening to the music and what other, every week there was, there was something new coming out and you've been so amazed by the sounds, frequencies and whatsoever, that the inspiration also was so big after the weekend to go to the studio and make something new after listening to so much stuff. Uh, the, the the experience has been so strong. Um, I don't know if the, how much the difference is like from when you were listening to the stuff and you've been in the clubs, but of, we had the thing then, of course, after the weekend, when we went to work, it was a studio to work with what we experienced after the weekend. So it was like one continuous line, more, more or less. I didn't so, go back to a job and worked on some, some totally something different, happy to wait for the weekend. It was like happy to wait for the weekend, but also happy to wait for the week to go to the studio again. Was it also an experience where you were not only experience and listening to the music you will also experience the reaction of people in the club to particular music it was of course then when you released your first stuff and um because especially in the beginning it was more an an anonymous how you say anonymous yeah anonymous thing. anonymous things um like the, the the music the producer wasn't the people didn't know who made the track they just heard a track and they went crazy or not. And when you heard the track you did um, and you could see the reaction of the people, it was such an uplifting feeling without being to have to be on some stage or something. You could enjoy it in the same way with the crowd. And that was quite um, quite, quite a strong uh, experience actually to have. And especially after a while when we released stuff once a month or twice a month, um it has been quite intense i mean i remember being in 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 the omen and i remember like the first times that i was there um and i had the same experience you know in london in in acid house clubs like shoom and so on but it was it was because of the the it was loud it was repetitive and it had this rhythm it sort of transported me in a solitary way yet with lots of people around me being transported in a solitary way. It was a different experience of listening to music than I had before, which is something that made it exciting as a consumer. Yeah, that's that's true. I uh, totally agree because all, it was so much about the music also. And it, exactly as you, as you mentioned, it is with the crowd, but you could be for yourself and just go with the flow somehow. And with the repetitive sounds, and you you could be in a trance state 
doesn't matter if people took drugs or not most of the people took drugs but it's the music have been so such there was such a tension uh which just took you uh on, on a couple of hours journey if you wanted yeah I mean, you had a very long collaboration period with Sven, and uh, I think it was over about seven or eight years. Um, and then, you know, albums come out like An Accident in Paradise, Barbarella, The Harlequin, The Robot and The Ballet Dancer. And the way that you developed, you became, in many ways, the sort of centre that other people, other musicians were, were looking at and being inspired by. How aware were you that you were both leaders um, in the sort of trance genre? Um, I don't know. I, I think not that much really in that time because we've been so in our tunnel doing our stuff and there's not much left on the left side or the right side because you I think also sometimes probably we've been kind even kind of in an arrogant way maybe uh because we I think it's uh, especially for the age and under 30 you just do you just follow your aim without thinking too much about it and um we didn't read so much reviews and stuff like this because we've been there have been so much other stuff to do music wise and it came later when when you get this intense, more intense recognition, which is then you get aware of it years later. Which you think, wow, that's quite a thing expected like this. And we, we knew that the stuff was strong, the music, we had successful releases, of course, and stuff. But we, as I said, not so much thinking about this particular view so much um, intensely that time. I read an article that said that you were aware that having a collaborator in the studio, Sven, helped unify the sounds um, of the albums that you made that may have not been there if you had been alone. Can yeah. you explain that? Um, the good thing, especially in the beginning, the first two, three albums, um, and I was young, and he was young, and we've, everything has been new. I did stuff he appreciated in a way, like on Excellent Paradise, you have instruments, flutes, cembalo. I never would have done this in that way on an ambient record. If I've been by myself, probably have, I would have thought too much about things. Can I do it or not? And then Sven was on the other side. You can do everything. If you like it, it's good. And uh, let's and I played around sometimes. Oh, that's nice. Let's use it. And it was like a classical cembalo little thing, whatever. And we just put it in, use it as a sample. Or on the another album, we even had a flute player with and we are violinists on, on, on a couple on one track. Because if he liked it, it was good. But um, the good thing is, while I would have maybe thought too much about it sometimes, is it cool or not? He said, yeah, it's good. We, we make it. Let's do it. We love it. And so the, the both sides have been an inspirational way to do things you wouldn't have done by yourself. He also brought in field sounds, didn't he? Sounds of his travels in India or... You know, yeah. um, and in a sense, when when I read that, I thought, OK, well, that really corresponds to um, developing music for films or series. Um, so do you think this was also I know that you, you know, you, that you're also getting involved in making um, film music. But was this a sort of preparation for what was to come in a sense? Uh, yeah, maybe it's like this. What I liked about especially the first albums with Sven, for me, it was like uh, similar to program music from the classical music. You have a, something in your mind and you describe it and make music and or it, the inspiration goes and when the listener listens to it, he makes his own movie in his mind. And also with the structure of the music, like 
make it 10 minutes, whatever, no, no pattern structure. And this was my connection to the classical music kind of with the modern electronic sounding music. And with the film music, it's a bit similar. You do stuff for, well, then given situation scenes, but it can be also, there's a kind of a connection indeed. And I did, I had the possibility to do my first film music in a collaboration. I was only 17, but I just slipped in somehow as a keyboard player. And I could see, oh, that's something I could imagine to do more. But up, over the years, I didn't have so much options to grow more and more. Just, I'll get on to film music in a minute, but I just want to talk a bit more about Sven or ask one more question, because you mentioned about um, creating these images in your mind while you're composing. Did you exchange the ideas of the visual images that you were composing sort of thing at that time? Don't go away. Ralph will be answering that question in just a second. But just a moment for me to ask you, please, to subscribe to this channel. It helps me. And it helps you because you'll be the first to hear when I upload something new on this channel. OK, let's get back to Ralph Hildenbeutel. Well, he came, I remember he came from, from as you said, from India, Goa once and uh, with a duct tape. And I, I did a lot of field recordings and, and let's use him. And he also had uh, already um a great a good com kind of complete idea for the album uh, accident paradise let's call it accident paradise and that's going to be the theme and we have paradise but there's going to be also an accident and so his vision was quite visual already which helped then to do the music on top with that with that visual ideas he brought in actually i mean one of the film music pieces that you did, which was to sort of put you on the radar by getting awards, was the um, Homage au Noir, which was directed by Ralph Schmerberg. How did that come about? And this, you know, this film is described as a poem to honor the culture of Africa, and it has no dialogue. Yeah. So I just wondered how, you know, if you think of film music, that you've probably done since and uh it's you are creating the music in a sense with the dialogue in mind as well so it's very different to do it without dialogue what what were the uh, i wouldn't say difficulties but what did you have to overcome to do this and what was your thinking when you went into it yeah i mean that's indeed what really different and one of the first I haven't done so much film music by then. And then you do something like this, which is not a typical film music. Um, it basically was to describe, you don't have to describe the pictures, the pictures were there. So you have to give the mood. I had a lot of field recordings as well, original recordings, which are involved in the music, um, made it one with the music in many cues and scenes. And um, the idea was also to respect, homage the culture aspect from where he did the shootings and bring on some from the electronical side of our time that on the ninth, when was it, 96, to make a melange of both worlds kind of, to transport it through a modern sounding aesthetic. Did Ralph approach you for that? He must have come to you because he'd heard your music or your contribution with, with Sven, I presume. Um, and he, he he came to you. What did he come to you with? Did he come to you with the finished film or was the film re-edited around what you composed? He came He came to, it was more like an IQ thing. He approached to IQ. I actually even don't know how they came together anymore. And they developed the idea i think in the beginning he was planning to just use several music tracks maybe to license them or maybe to ask somebody and then with iq they developed that idea to make com to completely movie with the movie has been finished by then to compose new original music for it 
And that's how we internal come to the decision. I could be the right man for it. And that's why, how we came together. And while the film was edited, more or less 100%, they had some temp tracks on it already. But I tried to be as free as possible from it so we could have really like an original music soundtrack and not nothing nothing which sounds like copied from something in a way of etc and he's been quite open and uh, to it and it went really well actually i mean iq was a the record company was a it was an interesting um grouping because it had what seemed to be in that period immense success and then it had really complicated issues going on um mm -hmm. towards towards the end and there were financial problems and it went into insolvency and and everything how did that change from it working to it not working um affect you in terms of your creativity how were you able to sort of keep creating when above you all these these issues are coming up yeah i think as you, on the one side it was kind of paradise for a musician to have this mid scene above you and you just could do whatever you wanted and for a couple of years it went even well everybody was happy and even financially which is important we had the system running and with more success and the music scene changing after years you have to look more how to also the label had to look how going to we define ourselves in the future and trying to go more artist related with productions like Wernan, uh, Dalicia, the BZ with Dalicia track, to have not just this 12 inch thing. The only artist on Ico by then was long form artist, was Sven actually with the albums and some other projects, but trying to develop other artists on a to make it sensible after a while. But it didn't went so well as expected. And on the other side, the label wanted to grow more and more. And I think that was a little bit the problem, trying to grow more, going to Berlin, making a bigger office. And but on the product product wasn't there to to finance it at the end of the day. And since IQ worked together with Warner, was a label from Warner Records at that time. At a certain point when the money is gone, you know what it is, then you have to see how you how you go on. But uh, I think that was the, the point of no return when it went down. And for us, Stevie, Matthias and I, who run the studios, we decided to stay in Frankfurt and not go to Berlin, which was good because we haven't been involved in a bankruptcy. And we changed our direction as well then, late 90s, because for us, the techno thing was kind of, everything was set for a while has been done and we thought we have to do something else now. And it was quite an interesting choice that you made. Yeah. And I completely understand um, your decisions because you meant, you know, you're saying that that era was essentially over and you had to go into a new, new directions. So what did you want to achieve with this, which was much more sort of commercial popularist direction yeah. that you went in with the company Schaubau? Well, after doing this music for like seven, eight years so intensely, it was kind of refreshing to say, and now we go, we do something new again, which was not new for us, because we've done pop tracks before, uh, before the techno time. And we thought, let's work artist related. Let's look for artists we can produce and work for. And let's try to make good classical pop songs. Uh, but bring in our influence from the whole electronic 90s era. And that was kind of an interesting challenge for us because it was back to the future a little bit, but also into the future, combining those two worlds. And that's what we quite did intensely with several artists. Songs, artist-oriented, but keeping this electronic vibe we, we lived for so many years before. I mean, you worked with really big names in Germany at that time, with Yvonne Cutterfeld, with, with um, Leith Aldine. And I think what's really fascinating is that earlier you said that techno broke all conventions. 
and now you are working back with the to conventions. Back to conventions, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but bringing partly of what you'd learnt and expressed in the decade before into this new music. How how was that period um, for you creatively? And was it I could see was it really a decision for you to be able to keep going? And do you view that period differently than you view the sort of techno era of the 10 years before? Yeah, <clears throat> I mean definitely. The 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 90s techno era have been really a very strong intense you don't have you don't you're not lucky to to be to have this situation often in life and we've been lucky i've been lucky to be there uh because you have to be in the right time and the right place as well to do this and it happened and this is rare and we we are where i was always really aware of it how rare it is because i could have been somewhere else uh, a couple of years later or earlier and i wouldn't have the opportunity to do that um the pop music thing is of course something different it was more like an approach to say i'm really interested i really want to try to do some proper pop music and as good uh, is kind of a new challenge because it has been an inspiration to do something else actually because you cannot i'm not somebody who can do the same thing for decades it's music I do it for decades, but within it's I like to challenge other directions. And this was just kind of a relief for us to say we don't have to do the perfect, coolest techno track or ambient album anymore. We just do something else now. We work with artists and uh and go that direction. Now when I see it, surely the 90s era has been more important than the pop era. But it has been for me also an important bridge to pop era to go where I am now, properly. Um, seeing after a while, I won't do pop music for the rest of my life. Even though I've been in London doing songwritings, everything, it was really amazing and nice. But I needed that to, for my way to go where I am now, I guess. Yeah, so because the last 15 years, you've been really in the 15 years, okay, there's some music of your own and so on and so forth, and produced other artists as well. But the majority of it seems to have been film music and film music has taken a greater importance into your life. Was that a conscious decision to move, well, you've done some before, so to move back into that area? Yeah, I think, I have to be honest, with the pop music, I've done lovely projects, I met lovely people, it's been have been successful. I was a bit bored after a while. And also it's really hard. You write like 70 songs and if you've got 10 songs pitched, you're all, already in a good level. And you speak to others, they they wrote 100 songs and had maybe two songs pitched. It's just such a waste of energy and creative energy. And so I forced it. I really wanted to go more and more into the film music thing, um, which were, took a while also, because you've been always the, the techno head, kind of. And it took really a while to establish there more. If you're not coming from that side, especially in Germany, if you don't have this classical, I, I studied composing, um, they, they think you cannot be a good film composer. Luckily, in that time, with the old streaming and everything, it opens much the the from composing side for the film music. It opens um, from what you could do and where musicians came from background wise doing film music, which was like the perfect timing for me, especially when I started to do more international stuff. I mean, I, I read that you actually worked on Verboten Lieber, which is a German soap <laughs> opera, Forbidden Love, for for people not speaking German, and. It's interesting because so that is obviously a sausage factory. Do you know what I mean? It's they're yeah. turning over so many, so many programs. And to work on that on the music, really, I presume, is a massive learning process for what was to come. What did you learn from that experience? It's exactly while I did some movies and projects, projects before when this job came, 
I did it together with Stevie BZ. We knew this is going to be very intense because it was a daily um, format. So we had to do every day music for 45 minutes episode. And I was sure this is probably not something for the rest of my life. And um, But this three or three and a half years we did it. It was so intense. I learned so much uh, in terms of being effective, working effective, work, working on a high level without having artist attitudes, just be professional and effective. And I took a lot of stuff, even if it was a soap, a sausage factory soap thing, uh, I, I took a lot out of it. I think it's a good school, definitely. Yeah, I think what's interesting about it is because there's such a quick turnover of the program, I'm wondering whether that quick turnover actually gave you more freedom. Do you know what I mean? Because maybe they haven't got time to, to check yeah. everything you're doing. Was it like that? A little bit. I mean, you had you worked with like, I don't know, 20, 30 directors because it's always changed. And then after a while, after a while you knew this guy is easy, She's easy. He's going to be more complicated. Some just let it go. What you do, you did your stuff with a freedom. Others have been really picky, and you thought, well, this is not a movie. We don't have the time to go in every queue like you do. Yeah, but it's so important. So you had to handle every kind of characters from that side also. Uh, sometimes you've been free. Sometimes they, they tortured you, like for a bloody episode from the daily soap <laughs> had to like go it's still late night to do little fixes and you thought nobody gonna take care of it because it's gonna be waiting for the next day already quite That's amazing <laughs> I, love that idea. I don't, I don't, I don't want to do it again but uh I, I can tell you it's uh it's kind of been kind of true I was really kind of there came a time when I thought I cannot do it anymore because also always the same and but then eventually it stopped by itself that quitted it and I, I thought it's good that the decision came from outside because it's of course you make a lot of money when you do like a daily on a on a ID on a state channel format but um, I was happy when it ended. <laughs> I mean I know you've worked on so many projects in between but I do want to talk about super sex so I have to get this in now. So <laughs> this, How did you get approached for that series and what did the director Manieri um say to you when she met you um so luckily when a couple of years ago i had the thing that came into the italian production thing i started to work with italian productions and um from that point uh, it was kind of a snowball thing uh after the first thing i i did and one after the other came so i in the last years i mainly worked for italian production and directors um, and so that's how it came with Super Sex because they knew stuff I've done before and they asked me and it was kind of a funny thing when, they, when the guy called me, we want to ask you if you want to do music for us here about the guy, uh, now an email, Rocco Sifredi. And I didn't know Rocco Sifredi. I know most, everybody knows when I say Rocco Sifredi, everyone ah, Rocco Sifredi. I, I hadn't, didn't know what to do with the name. So I Googled Rocco Sifredi. I was like, Oh, okay, here we go. <laughs> That's um, interesting. <laughs> and I thought, yeah, well, why not? I know it was like a proper serious company and everything. So, and then for Netflix, so I thought, okay, it's, kind of, it's going to be some some serious thing. And then the talking stuff. Manieri was the showrunner, and I had three directors. I was um, brought in by actually one of the directors, Francesca, who and another Francesca who saw stuff I did in in Italy. And it have been a lot of talkings because it's have been such a delicate theme and there have a lot of discussions between producers, directors, Netflix, how, not to go too dark, how dark can we go, how pushy we need to be, how fun we need to be, and all this, bad, finding the right balance. Uh, and it has been a really like a long process, actually, on this, on this show. I mean, it's interesting. I've actually interviewed Rosa Freddy. A friend of mine was making a documentary oh, okay. about the porno industry in Hollywood <laughs> when I was on holiday there about 20 years ago. And so she was going to the Hustler building where <laughs> all these porn stars were putting their hands in concrete, like the, uh, oh, yeah. the, the Walk of Fame. 
Yeah. And, and I always wondered, why do they put their hands in concrete? If <laughs> anyhow. Uh, <laughs> and I, that's it. But anyhow, Rocco Sofredi, I think it was him. I mean, I know I interviewed him, but I interviewed <laughs> Big Ron and all these other porn stars and female <laughs> porn stars. And um, I think he was there with his mother. It was very, <laughs> it was for me, not knowing that industry at all, yeah. it was a very family oriented yeah industry which really was a bit shocking for me do you know what i mean it yes, sort of felt like totally. this is this is really weird and uh i mean it was quite an experience to, to be there and okay, i yes. i like what you said about what they the i know that netflix were very it's it's been a very sensitive process because you know making a, a series about a porn star um they didn't want to explode it into you know exploiting sort of things and uh yeah. especially in an era that we we live today so what i found interesting about your music it really that it's really like you're delving into different eras and delving into different influences how did you actually approach it once you got the brief i mean it's probably have been yeah the most eclectic score i've ever done and um it's because of all this, like for the Italians, the series is kind of, and the the, the main actor said, it's kind of like a sexual, sexual in the film-wise, a revolution, uh, because they never have sex scenes really in their movies and in the series. They have everything else. They do great movies, but kind of this prudery. And for many Italians, that's like this bigotry, double mole standards. And for them, it's kind of doing this about Rocco Sifredi is so re revealing. Others are so, how can you do something like about the porn star and glorify him? So, and I think that's all mirrored also in the story from, from the series. Um, while they had this strong emotional part with family, brother, relation to the mother, and, and the, the showrunner, Manier, she wanted to have it kind of, she, she said even, think about great movies like once upon a time in america and stuff like this and i wasn't thinking like what is this is something completely different like a porn star and this coming up with this this movie but i understood later what she wanted to tell she wanted to dive deep into this deep into the family saga thing about the decades and then on the other side of course you have porn sets fun shoots and 80s and 90s and and, and all the sexual clubs and everything like this so everything came together so I had to do, I had to do kind of emotional orchestral pieces for the all this emotional parts and and then in the next episode even in the 80s and you have to do 80s music grabbing all the my old synthesizers here and doing stuff like this and then the next one is in the 90s and then you go back to drama orchestra and then try to bring it a little bit together so it's not too, it's still one story, right? Trying to involve the themes in all these different style, music styles, electronic or strings or piano, whatever. So, I mean, quite for, quite amazing to do it, but quite intense also, in fact. How did you bring the contradictions that you talked about before, about sort of the idea of religion, of Italy, of sex, and then, of course, of masculinity and what does masculinity mean, which is a sort of central theme of the series, that all those sort of conflicting things, um, how did you bring those together in single tracks? Um, not so easy to describe. I mean, I often start not to... You see, how can I say? um it's the it's the scene it's a cue it's the some a situation which needs some music and then above it it comes the feeling which you need to transport it's done not just a situation because you have to think about the actor uh, not the actor the the, 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 the character. person the character and what's the mean it's not just a fun thing now so make it a bit more spicy or it's a uh, very dramatic but there's also a a lucky part in it so it's from situation to situation uh 
thinking actually um trying and to combine it and then you go over it again and again and also recompose things and try to connect themes to bring all these things together that you hear something a, a theme a motive from one emotional part in a more electronic happy piece then you have still have this little edge which connects it in, in a certain way i don't know if it makes sense what i try to explain here yeah. I mean, you mentioned, you know, you mentioned when you worked for for Bolton Lieber and that that TV series, and that occasionally you would be sent back to change something and have to work on it overnight. This is, you know, this is a big thing. This is a big, expensive series made by Netflix, um, which is a huge company. Um, and I just wondered what control and what pressures were there on you in terms of what you had to do, or were you given pretty much creative freedom? I think bigger it, it gets, uh, the more you have to be able to see the other team playing things and more cooks you have and more people saying things. And sometimes you have, which is sometimes not so easy at the composer, director has a vision, producer has a vision, Netflix has a vision. Uh, Netflix is the boss, but still director says, I want it like this. And then briefings, notes, we have to push it more. And then the director goes to you, yeah, but we keep it a bit like this way. And in the end, they, they think, is the composer not able to do what we say? And I think, no, I do what you want, but you have to get it sorted in the whole team. So there is um Everybody was really nice. That's a good thing. No, never arguing, fighting. But there is a pressure because, especially with the for them, for everybody, for Netflix, it was a delicate thing uh, to have this show. So everybody wanted to do it perfect. They even did some reshootings shortly before the mixing and stuff like this. So just to see how how much they rethought things and even music included. I one I think one and a half year working on that. And that show is um, quite longer than most of the other stuff I've done so far because they're moving, moving the release again because they wanted to rethink about things, that, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, so the music for this show has got an incredible reception and people are really talking about it. How um, gratifying has it been for you after going through that whole process and creating, as you said, all these different styles and somehow having a theme going on at the same time how gratifying has it been to actually have this as a as a real success as a big success yeah it's it's really lovely because um i say it's a the, on the one side is the best paid portfolio i can ever imagine <laughs> because i can show everything but no it's also because you never know how it ends up if you do something it could be it could have been a total flop or people hate it or um, so it, I was so happy that it went even still discussed there was and uh, polarizing it was success and the reception for the music was really really good and this yeah it's like the honey which goes down like this yeah you can after a while waiting and find its release and then you don't know how to react and then, and especially when the music gets an extra recognition which is not you don't have it often that is people talk about music even if it's great or not great but in this case it was really nice to see that yeah i mean you talked about your piano teacher when you were, were uh, very young um and how that experience gave you so much experience into different types of music um and you said at the beginning of this interview how that has played into your life throughout your life and particularly in this, it seems to have had an in, in, incredible uh, importance. Absolutely. Especially a project like this, where I had, as I said, I, I've, I've been doing classical pieces for orchestra and doing all the string arrangements. I, I had to do a piano piece, like a Schumann, Chopin-esque style, 
where the the girl plays the piano gets more and more wild and then they ask me i can can you really it's a long montage and i, I did a four, five and a half minutes piece in the end of course i cut it down <laughs> to one minute and then changed the music to okay well, i have done all this and then on the other side with the bass the influence and all the stuff from the 90s which i could use and i was so grateful that i have this two mainly these two sides, uh, the, the, the strong piano education, a piano, not just piano, classical uh, theory and everything she gave me, and then the, the electronic nerd times, to, to be able to do all that stuff, it, I wouldn't know how, probably they would have to change, exchange the composer if I could do it like this, or add another one, I have no idea. Have you noticed that this has opened up new doors for you? Uh, well, not yet. Um, I noticed a lot of reaction, nice positive reaction, um, uh, but I didn't have like like 10, 10 new offers on the table yet. <laughs> Let's see. I noticed the recognition is very, very big, and um, I'm sure many, not only Italian film people, seen it. And so I'm. Let's see. I'm, I'll take it relaxed and easy and. Mm -hmm maybe if something is coming um would be grateful yeah no i think it is well ralph hildenburg well, thanks very much i mean i really want to uh, uh, say a big appreciation for what you've done in your life partly in the era with sven of course which was you know also an important era in my life but what i love about it is that i think you're approaching a sort of <laughs> new era for you which will be bigger and uh, better and obviously in film music. So I really thanks. hope that comes to you now. Ralph, thanks very much. Thanks so much for having me. I was really pleased for the invitation. Thanks a lot. Up there is an interview I recommend. Down there is where you can find all the podcast interviews. And here is where you can connect. <laughs>